Only a few have studied the text of the curious collection of riddles, oracles, and mathematical problems that has been preserved by this bizarre and unique book. In my contribution to this very interesting conference on Greek literary epigram, and let me thank uh, Maria, Chris, and all the people from USCLA who have supported this uh, conference, I intend to do the following. I will try to shed some light on the linguistic and thematic relations between these epigrams, the older riddles quoted by Athenaeus in the 10th book of his Deipnosophists, and the newer riddles that were going to become more and more popular in Byzantine literature. After the composition of Kephala's anthology, and this without forgetting the connection between the main features of our Greek enigmatic epigrams and some of their Latin equivalents. I will also discuss some significant features of a portion of these poems the approximately 50 riddles that have been much discussed between the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, but have been fairly overlooked in the most recent times. Don't forget that the last scholarly edition of the book was published by Buffier in the Budet collection in 1970. That means almost half a century ago. There are some exceptions to this statement, though. The more relevant one is the paper delivered by Christine Lutz during the conference Musa Paizei, held in May 2011 by the Institute of Classical Studies of the University of Warsaw, a conference attended by colleagues that are attending this conference too, such as Valentina Garulli. In her paper, recently published by De Greuter in the Proceedings of the Warsaw Conference, Professor Lutz, who has become a real authority in the field of enigmatic poetry since 2010, when she published her extremely interesting book on technopegnia, Form Spiele in der Griechischen Dichtung, Lutz has divided the 50 enigmatic riddles of the 14th book into four main categories, according to the devices used by their authors to disguise the solutions. Metonymy, metonymy analogy, pan double meaning, paradox, and myth and has asked herself what makes a riddle a riddle, giving an answer, the following answer. A riddle of the kind we find in the Greek anthology is a description of an object or a situation which disguises this object by certain means or devices with the aim to puzzle the recipient. But if we want to put these mysterious riddles into a wider context, and I call them mysterious, not because we do not know their solutions, but because we ignore who wrote them and when, we should try to see them diachronically. Let us start with this one. From the sea, I have a fishy parentage, and one contest can bring me to the games of Dionysus. In the stadium, after anointing my body with oil, I slew by my hands the son of Demeter, in the second place, I sent out from both sides of me a mass of giants pulled by many hands. In his commentary, Jacobs was forced to acknowledge that totum hoc a enigma aduc expectat o edipum. This riddle is still waiting for its Oedipus, because yet not been able to guess its solution. William Roger Payton, to whom we owe the translation I've quoted, the more recent translation of the book, almost one century old, because it was published in 1918 at the end of World War, and I'm glad, I was glad yesterday to hear from Professor Tuller that <laughs> someone <laughs> is taking care of a new translation. Peyton writes that the answer has not been guessed. Some scholars did make some attempts, though. Fröner suggested the solution Cantaros, a fish, a vessel, the beetle, and one of the three inlets of the harbor of Piraeus. Carrington suggested Lycnos, another fish, but also the lamps used to light up the banquets, to chase off darkness, and to help the seafarers. Olert suggested Onos, again a fish, again a vessel, the millstone and the capstan. Here I'm not interested in the correct answer to the riddle. You may add your own solution to this list if you wish. But in the structure of this enigmatic epigram that is based on homonymy, 
Whatever the answer, it must be a name that means different things, the different things hinted at by the text <coughs> or the poem. Such a poem follows a very a well-known and quite old pattern, since riddles of the same kind were called archaiotatoi, very archaic, by Athenians. In the section of the 10th book of the Deipnosophists, where the learned banqueters uh, begin to discuss one of the customary symposia pastimes, riddles, Athenaeus speaks of a very ancient time of riddle, uh, uh, which was closely related to the true nature of the enigmatic technique and had to do with logical concepts and logical reasoning. Athenaeus quotes three examples. The third one is the following. What is the same in the sky, on earth, and in the sea? Its solution, Athenaeus says, involves the use of anonymity. Quote, for the bear, the snake, the eagle, and the dog are found in the sky, on earth, and in the sea. The right answers are the names of some animals that were used not only for indicating the most common creatures that lived on earth, but also for the less common ones that, li that lived in the sea. Arctos was also the name of a crustacean, Ophis the name of an eel, Ayatos the name of a fish similar to the ray, and Kion the name of a kind of shark. We have seen this in uh, uh, Valentina's paper. And of course, there were also the names of their astronomic counterparts, great and little bears, and so on. But this riddle is even older than Athenaeus. In the prologue of Wasps, Aristophanes makes fun of one of his most beloved targets, Cleonymus, in this way. A slave tells he has dreamt an eagle, a gigantic bird, descend upon the marketplace. It seized the brazen buckler with its talons and bore it away into the highest events, heavens. Then I saw it was Cleonymus that had thrown away. Another slave explains the dream by saying that this Cleonymus is a riddle worth propounding among guests. How can one and the same animal have cast away its buckler both on land, in the sky, and at sea? Thanks to this passage, which is the first occurrence of the word griefos, a synonym of enigma, but also the first witness of the habit of asking riddles during symposia, we find out that this kind of question based on homonymy remained popular from the classical to the Byzantine period. And we also learn that a riddle can be uttered in trimeter, Aristophanes, prose, Athenaeus, and elegiac couplets in the Greek anthology. Such a riddle was popular in Latin literature as well. In the first century AD, so after Aristophanes, but before Athenaeus, Quintilian warned his pupils from using words that had many different meanings, because this might cause obscurity, as in the case of the word Taurus, because whether we are speaking of an animal, or a mountain, or a constellation, or the name of a man, or the root of a tree, will not be understood unless it is made clear. Later, Sometimes between the 4th and the 5th century, Symposius or Symphosius wrote a riddle equally based on the many different meanings of the word Taurus, but with a funny mythological note, because the poet chose to put the riddle in the mouth of the white bull that, together with Poseidon anger, caused the crazy love of the poor pacifier. A tyrant sport, though wooden members led, my name to many mountains I have spread. I rat the heavens, yet on earth I tread. But let us forget for a moment these Latin relatives and let us go back to Athenaeus. Some of the riddles he quotes were gathered for the first time by Edmond Cugny in the seventh section of the appendix to the Greek anthology he published in 18, 1890, a total of 77 epigra enigmatic epigrams not included in Kefala's collection. Some of these riddles have been discussed by Jan Kwapis, the Polish professor who organized the conference I mentioned earlier. He tries to demonstrate that the first collection of riddles date to the Hellenistic period. This is probably true, and it's also true that among the more famous collections used by Kefalas for his anthology, Miliager, Philip, and Agatius, there were also the less famous collections used by Athenaeus as a source for the riddles he quotes in his book. In some manuscripts, as Cameron has shown in his book on Greek anthology, riddles quoted by Athenaeus, but not collected by Kephalas stay side by side with riddles collected by Kephalas, but not quoted by Athenaeus. 
and we cannot rule out the possibility that some enigmatic epigrams inserted by Kefalas in his collection were later excluded by editor of the Palatine manuscript, the famous J. In the Laurentianus uh, 3216, a manuscript compiled by Planudes between 1280 and 1283, and you know that Planudes was very concerned with epigrams, we find in one page a riddle quoted by Athenaeus, but not by Kefalas, followed by a long series of riddles taken from AP 14, but interrupted by another riddle on Penelope's daughter, not quoted neither by Athenaeus nor by Kephalas, a riddle which is attributed to the Emperor Julian. Again, in the uh, manuscript from, um, which is now in Paris, Supplementum Grecum uh, 690, a manuscript probably written in the second half of the 11th century, we read among a fairly good number of later Byzantine riddles, a riddle quoted by Athenaeus, but not by Kephalas, and a riddle quoted by Kephalas, but not by Athenaeus. It is a very witty riddle. My husband slew my father-in-law. My father-in-law slew my husband. My brother-in-law slew my father, and my father-in-law slew my father. The solution, not easy, but not too difficult, for those who are acquainted with Greek mythology, is given and discussed in the manuscript, since the text of the riddle is followed by a thorough explanation, which is something very unusual. So, uh, the, I'm sorry, the image is not very clear, but you can see the first two lines have a heading where it's written clearly, cl it's, it is clearly uh, read about the first word, which is zetema, uh, problem, question, riddle. So a riddle which is written in elegiac couplets. And uh, the verse say this. And then uh, these two lines contain the text of a riddle in a version which is very similar to the one we find in the Palatine anthology. And then we have another heading where you can see uh, which one is uh, a hermeneia, what is the explanation of uh, these uh, lines? And then we have, in these four lines, a kind of a paraphrasis, a prose version of the riddle, where uh, the text of the epigram is explained in a more clear way. But we still miss something which is very important. Who is this figure? And so, in fact, we have here another heading which is this one, where the author tells poion prosopon, so which is the character. And we see the last line, uh, which is something like, eideinai cre os e andromache estin he uh, father-in-law, and, and so on. Okay? <laughs> the presence in the same manuscript of riddles quoted by different authors Athenaeus and witness in different collections, Kephalas, may therefore prove that there might have been anthologies of epigrams older than Kephalas that contain poems written in very different times. The Andromache riddle is mentioned by Christine Lutz as the first example of the section mythology. The second example is another Palatine riddle. Having been killed, I killed my killer. He did not go to Hades, though, but I have died. The figure in question of Heracles and Nessus, the centaur Nessus killed by Heracles, killed his killer by poisoning him with his own blood. We cannot tell who wrote this elegiac couple, but we know where he took the idea from. In the last part of Sophocles, Women of Trachis, the dying hero remembers the prophecy his father Zeus had given him. Quote, it was predicted to me by my father long ago that I should never die at the hand of any of the living, but at that of one who was dead and lived in Hades. So this monster, as the divine prophecy had foretold me, has killed me, I being alive and he dead. So as you can see, the words are similar. And in Sophocles, we even read that the actual Heracles killer is in the underworld. Kephala's anthology, not only the one we have thanks to the Palatine manuscript, but also the other more or less similar copies that circulated on the following centuries, did contribute to the diffusion of the riddle genre, since many late 
Byzantine poets took inspiration from the poems collected by him. But, as I said before, there were probably other anthologies. I would not say they were fuller than Kefalas. They just contained different poems, where later poets have been able to find other interesting riddles. For instance, uh, there is a smart enigma uh, from the Sappho of Antiphanes, quoted by Athenaeus in the following form. There is a feminine being which keeps its babes beneath its bosom. They, though voiceless, raise a cry sonorous over the waves of the sea and across all the dry land, reaching what mortals they desire. And they may hear even when they are not there, but their sense of hearing is dull. Well, this text becomes, in the Byzantine collection of Basilius Megalomites, composed sometime between the 13th or the 14th century, there is a feminine being speaking and talkative, which keeps and hides its babes beneath its bosom. The babes are tongueless, since nobody has taught them to speak, but their voice is high and sonorous. They speak to the mortals they desire over the waves of the sea, and over the islands, and over the land. Even when they are present, it is not possible to hear them, but the sense of hearing of the babes is dull. Both text and solution are almost the same. In Antiphanes, the solution is epistole, epistle, epistle, letter. In Basilius, it is biblos, book. The meter is different because the iambic trimeters have become political verses, pentadecasyllables. If the riddle is not present in Kefala's collection, or better, if, we, if it cannot be found in the only complete revision of the anthology we possess, that is the Palatine manuscript, where did Basilius uh, take it from? Did he find it in Athenaeus? But if he found it there, we might expect that he had taken inspiration from the other riddles quoted by Athenaeus to compose other poems, which he did not do. So the only probable guess is that he found it in, a, it in an anthology which contained riddles of different ages, included a few riddles that are present in the 14th book of the Palatine Anthology, as we will see. There are many other similar cases I might quote, but I know that the time has been given up by the organizing committee is almost over. So I will conclude my paper with a short analysis of two other kinds of riddle. The first one is the most typical enigmistic wordplay, consisting in the elimination of the first letter of a word and the consequent birth of another one. In the section named A Few Special Types, Lutz quotes two Palatine riddles almost identical. 14, 105, and 106. The text of uh, 105, which has been also edited by Hopkinson in his Cambridge Anthology of Greek Poetry of the Imperial Period, we read, I am a ground-seeking limb of animals. If you take away one letter, I turn into a part of the head. If you take away the next, I again become an animal. If again another, you will find not only one, but 200. This riddle was very popular among the Byzantine poets as well. We, in the collection we, of Basilius, we find not one, but two different versions of the same riddle. Which is the solution? The, solution, the first one is the word pus, no? a limb of animal, foot. If we take away one letter, we have another part of the body of the head. So we have us, which is ear. If we take away the next one, we have us, which is pig. And if we take away, again, the first one, we have sigma, which uh, was 200. Uh, again, in Basilius, we have a different meter. In Palatine anthology, uh, we have uh, elegiac couplet. And in Basilius, we have dodecasyllable. But even if the Palatine riddle was composed during the imperial period, as Opkiso thinks, and I do not have any serious reason to contradict his opinion, the origins of this kind of wordplay are older. In Theocritus' Syrinx, we read the enigmatic expression, the edge of a shield lacking a P. I cannot show you the text, but that's the translation. And that means that if we take away the letter P from the word Petis, the name of the nymph which was loved, who was loved by the god Pan, we have the word Itis, the edge of a shield. And if we move from Greece to Rome, we can find examples that are surely imperial. In his biography of the emperor Tiberius, Suetonius tells us that because of his fondness of wine, Claudius Tiberius Nero was given the funny nickname, 
Biberius Caldius Mero, a tribal word play where the shrew displacement of some letters turns the emperor into a lover of warm and mixed wine. Here, the Greek example antecedes the Roman one, but there are cases where the readers of the Greek anthology happen to be more recent than the Roman equivalents. The so-called charade, the word play that through the union of two different small words creates a third longer word, can be found twice time, twice in the 14th book of the Palatine Anthology. The first one is the following. Write down the second mother of wine and add to the limb the limb. And you see her father's bedfellow as his fatherland. Since wine is a metonymy for Dionysus, his first mother was Semele, but the second was Zeus, or better, his thigh, which in Greek is Meros, where if we add the limb to this word, better if we add an article, because in the language of grammar, this is the meaning of the word arthron, which we find in the riddle, we get the word ho meros, which is the name of the poet who, according to some uh, biographers, was born in Smyrna, the town whose name came from the woman notorious for having had an ancestral relationship with her father. But the oldest example of charade I know comes from Varro, as Alus Gellius says in his Attic Night. I don't have the, the, uh, the Latin text and I cannot repeat it by her, but the place is, uh, this is the translation. I don't know if he is uh, uh, semel minus or twice minus, that is uh, bis minus, or both of these, but uh, I once heard that he did not want to give its place to Jupiter himself. So the solution is the god Terminus, which is not semel minus nor bis minus, but ter minus. And uh, when the Romans decided to build uh, the temple of Jupiter in the Capitolium, they did not dare to remove the shrine of the ancient god and decided to leave inside the new temple a sippus there marked the sacred place to the ancient god. So if you came here brought by the desire to know who wrote the riddles of the 14th book of the Greek anthology and when, you might probably be disappointed. The topic and the structure of most of these riddles have so many antecedents that they might have been written in a very large span of time. But if you decide to use these or similar riddles at a dinner to show off, and the guests blame you by saying you are ex Alexandrian or even Byzantine, you might object by saying that you are also Latin and even classical. Thank you. <laughs>